we're going to uh, continue the, the subject of like commissioning and, and equipping and all the things because I don't know if y'all realize, uh, but the world is a mess. It's a mess. Demons everywhere. And God has his church here to be the salt of the earth. But salt that ain't seasoning things ain't doing nothing. Like the spaghetti I mentioned yesterday. It's like we <laughs> had to bring it back around. Like we, God has saved us and kept us here on purpose because he wants to use us to show forth his glory, to, to give uh, instruction to the world about his character, his nature. Even you, the only reason you are a Christian is because someone told you about Jesus. Because somebody prayed you towards Jesus. Because somebody showed you Jesus. And so now God has given us the, the opportunity to do the same thing for other people. The, the thing is, is that when it comes to grace, grace is so amazing because God saw us in our sin being raggedy. And he sent Jesus to redeem us so that we can be at peace with the Father. God removed our heart of stone and, and gave us a heart of flesh. He made and, and created us as new creatures. He changed our minds and he changed our motives. God showed out when he saved his enemies. But the grace, the grace isn't just in the salvation. There's, there's another miracle attached to that one, which is that when God saved you, he also set you apart for the work of ministry. You understand how crazy that is? That, that you were, according to scripture, an enemy of God. But because of grace, you are now called his ambassador. The awkward part is that for me, I, I would have preferred if God just saved me and sent me straight on to glory. Just took me right up on out. As soon as I said, Lord, I give my life to you. And he like, all right. Like treated me. Why I can't be Enoch? <laughs> I'm chasing after you. Make me disappear. <laughs> my life would have been easier. Because nobody, nobody really wants to deal with the cost of ministry. The loneliness. The angst the irritation, the extreme degree of integrity that's required simply by virtue of professing Christ. The devils you got to fight in your home, in your marriage, with your children. The fact that you are working for the kingdom of light, even the, the kingdom of darkness will come against your children. Like, don't, nobody wants to, to do that. Nobody wants to deal with the jealousy from peers that you thought loved you but want your position. Nobody wants to deal with the constant awareness and insecurities that rise up in you when God calls you to do something. Nobody wants to deal with that. Most of us just, we just want to be saved. We don't want to be sent. But what a privilege it is that God has given us the opportunity to suffer with Christ out of commitment to his gospel. When God saved you. He was also sending you. With that said, I want us to look at John 4 today with Jesus' ministry to the woman at the well. Be because I want us to learn from Jesus on how to do ministry. W with anything, whether it's tying your shoes, whether it's potty training, whether it's riding a bike, whether it's riding with a pencil. We, we have to be taught. We have to be taught how to do ministry like Jesus because we have a lot of models of ministry, whether that's pastors, whether that's elders, whether that's deacons, whether that's people in our homes. But we don't ultimately want to learn how to do ministry like pastor so-and-so. We, we don't even want to be deceived by the ministry of prophet warlock or evangelist witch. We, we don't want to not have a grid for what real ministry looks like because we're looking at them more than we look at Jesus. We, we want to learn how to do ministry in the way that Jesus does ministry. His, his ways and his wisdom and his love 
has to be the grid we use to define Christian ministry. So that as we go back into our churches, so as we go back into our homes, so we go back into our workplaces, into our universities and our schools, that I, I don't want us to be Christians that are content with sitting on the sidelines. God is requiring of us to be a generation of people who will lace up their shoes and get in the game. Let's pray. Lord, we need you. We always need you. In this moment, we need you to speak. We need you to communicate to us by your spirit, by your word, through your son. God, we, we help our minds to understand your scriptures. Help us, our hearts to, to resonate with the, the truth of it, God. Give us the wisdom to know how to apply it to the particular seasons that we have, the different giftings that you've graced us with, and the, the, the context that you've placed us in. Give us, give us direction and vision for how you want us to do ministry, God. We need your help. We need your power. And we also need your courage. We pray this in your name. Amen. I want to put before you six observations of Jesus' ministry to the woman at the well that we can and should apply to our own ministry efforts. Amen? Um, the first observation is to lead with your humanity. Lead with your humanity. How many of you have heard the name Jim Jones? Not Dipset, not the rapper. <laughs> Some of them are like, oh, I thought you was going to say Cameron and them. No, 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 no. Cult leader, Jim Jones. She like, oh, yeah, 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 him too. Um, <laughs> Jim Jones was the leader of a cult church called the People's Temple during the mid to late 70s. Jim Jones came to national prominence when he led his flock from California to a community that he constructed in the country of Guyana that he called and named after himself called Jonestown. While he was there, most of us are aware on some level of Jim Jones and, and the infamy that he left because he eventually led his followers to commit a mass suicide by drinking poison Kool-Aid. I watched a documentary about Jim Jones and the Jonestown Massacre because I have a thing for watching documentaries about murderers. Don't, don't ask me why. It's just very interesting to me to, to see the human condition play out. Anyway, um, one of the things that was interesting is that what was compelling for many people for the reason that they followed Jim Jones is that he presented himself as God to them. In his, in his sermons, if you want to call him that, in his teachings, in his communication, in his, in his interactions, even in some of the behaviors that he would mimic, he, he would present himself as God. But the thing is, that was in San Francisco. When they saw him in the pulpit, they actually believed he was God. They trusted he was God. They followed him as God. When they, that it was easier for them to believe what he was saying about himself when there was some degree of distance between the preacher and the, pre and the people. But when they moved to Guyana, when they moved into Jonestown, and their God became their neighbor, they saw him up close and personal. They saw his addiction. They saw his mental state. They saw his instability. And one of the followers in the documentary said that the closer he got to Jim Jones, the more human he became. I say all that to say is that in your ministry to anybody, you need to embrace the fact that you are not God. That, that you are a whole human being. And a part of being a human being means that you have limitations and you have weaknesses. But in your humanity, your weaknesses are not hindrances, hindrances to God's glory if you understand them as opportunities to experience God's power. Before you do anything that God has called you to do, you usually feel a bit insecure about it. God has called you to disciple this person, or God has called you to lead a Bible study, or God has called you to have a hard conversation. You, you start to, to shame yourself for the experience of the insecurity. So much so that you try your best to get over it, Instead of looking to your insecurities, like looking past your insecurities to, to point you towards the nature of God. 
Because all your insecurities prove is that you've come face to face with a challenge that you don't have the human resources to overcome. I'll say it again. All your insecurities mean is that you have come face to face with a challenge that you don't have the human resources to overcome. Your insecurities remind you that you're human. And if you're human, that means you need, you need a power outside of yourself to do everything that God has called you to do. But if God's grace really is sufficient, my human weaknesses are always setting me up to experience God's power. The mindset of Jim Jones is very much present in Christian ministry. We all have to fight a God complex that tempts us to believe that we have to be more than what we are to be useful. That, that you can't be weak and lead well. That you can't have a stuttering problem and speak authoritatively. That you can't lead a Bible study if you have a learning disability. That your marriage has to be perfect for you to disciple somebody that's engaged. That you need to know all 66 books of the Bible to have one conversation on your campus about Jesus. There's a sense in which we think God-likeness, perfection in our body, perfection in our personality, perfection in our gifts, that that will make our ministry better when in fact, perfection would only lead you to do ministry independent of God's help. If, if, if you were good at everything, you wouldn't need God for anything. No wonder God gives you calls that you cannot show up for unless you need him. One thing, one thing pride is good at, pride shows up in a lot of ways. One thing it's good at is it makes us discontent with ourselves. It makes us discontent with what we are and who we are. Namely, it makes us discontent with our position as people made of flesh and blood. Pride wants you to despise your limitations. That's why we don't pray without ceasing. We think that prayerlessness is a time problem. Prayerlessness is always a humility problem. You feel like you are sufficient within yourself. Therefore, you don't, you're not as needy, therefore you don't pray. So you could, you could be busy or you could be lazy, but at the end of the day, to pray more, you need to humble yourself and recognize that if I am a human being, I always need God. Here's the good news. Here's the good news. Jesus in this text is going to show us that your humanity it's not a hindrance to your ministry. Your humanity is the vehicle of your ministry. Look at verse 2. Now when Jesus learned, I didn't even read the text, I'm sorry. Now when, <laughs> now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sakar near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Jesus has left one town and he's on his way to another. He sits down at a well because he's tired from all the walking he done did. A woman comes along, and what is the first thing that Jesus says? First, let's establish what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, hey, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the one who was and who is and who is to come. Nice to meet you, ma'am. <laughs> Jesus doesn't begin his ministry to the woman at the well by revealing his divinity. He begins his ministry by displaying his human weakness. This, this is God in the flesh, not hiding the fact or being ashamed of the fact that he's tired. This is, this is God in the flesh, very much open to the, the fact that he is thirsty. Mind you, this is the same person that made water. This is the same person who is the source of all energy. But he is willing to submit himself to be what he doesn't have to be so that you can be all he's called you to be. Everything that God has called you to do, you need his help for you to do it. Why? Because you're human. D.L. Moody, an evangelist in the 1800s, was preaching all over the place in his, the earliest stages of his ministry. He said that he was trying to compete with the busyness of Spurgeon, which is a random theological fact, but stupid. But anyway, he's preaching at his church on Sundays, 
preaching at everybody else's church during the week. And his, his teaching was considered helpful, but it lacked something. I, I'm sure it had the theological depth and, and insight that was necessary, but there was just something about his teaching that people said needed help. One night, D.L. preached at a Sabbath school, and some folks got up and asked for prayer, which made D.L. excited. It, it made him feel like what he did was good enough was effective, was, was, was powerful. So he left feeling all excited. And, and you know how sometimes older saints can discern better than you? An older man that Moody had never met, D.L. Moody, and had never saw again, he followed Moody out the door of the church while he was on his way home. And he grabbed Moody by the hand and he looked him in the face and he said, young man, when you speak again, Make sure you honor the Holy Ghost. I say that because doing ministry in your humanity requires power. What, what did Jesus, Jesus, Jesus say? He said, when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you will receive power. You need power to preach effectively in your humanity. You, you need power to be courageous in your humanity. You need power to, 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 to tell the truth and to shame the devil and your humanity. You can't do nothing God has called you to do without the Holy Ghost's help. To be effective in ministry, it is not actually your humanity that you need to lay aside, but your sin. Because it's your sin that tells you that you can do God's work without God's hand on it. Sin is the enemy of your ministry, but your humanity is the vehicle of your ministry. Therefore, what you need most is not to be less of yourself, but to have more of the Holy Spirit's power. Observation number two, be curious about cultural context. Be curious. If you don't take away nothing, be curious. Ask questions. Look at verse seven. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. When I use the word context, what I mean is it's, it's anything that helps explain something. So if someone said, uh, that's Jackie, the context, the discernible context of Jackie right now is that she's short. She's black, she has a gap with amazing hair That's the, and eyebrows. That's the context. I know what the Lord gave me, that's good. I, that's. <laughs> Tattoos, that's context too. And, and so that, that, those, those little details and specifics explain me, right? So in this passage, what, what is the context that helps us understand the person that Jesus is getting a drink from? It says that she is a woman from Samaria. Knowing that she's a woman gives you a sense of what she's probably been through, how she might think and what she might need. Knowing that she's a Samaritan gives you context for what she might believe, what some of her religious affiliations are, some of the traditions and heritage, heritages that she's inherited and how it might influence the way she's even engaging with Jesus. As a Samaritan woman, as a Samaritan, in her world, she was looked at as a half-breed. Samaritans were the product of a time when the Israelites uh, were in uh, foreign nations, and the people of Israel and the foreign nations started having babies, and they came out as Samaritans. So they were considered an impure group of people. They weren't as pure as Abraham's folk. Does that make sense? Now, when you add woman to Samaritan, it takes on a whole nother thing. It takes on a whole nother context. Because I read even a Jewish text when I was studying this that said that Samaritan, Samaritan woman had their periods from the cradle. If you understand anything about Levitical law, what they're implying is, is that Samaritan women are ritually unclean since the day that they are born. That's important. That context helps you to understand why she is so surprised that Jesus asked her for a drink. Because it meant that as a Jewish man, he was willing to touch what she touched. He's willing to drink from what she drank from. He was even willing to deal with the perception of him becoming unclean to make her clean. Context. Context. So her cultural context shapes how she views Jesus. In real life, when you meet somebody, 
a few things might be contextually obvious, which is age, maybe social status, maybe relationship, depending on if they got a ring on their finger and even then things get weird. But for the most part, for the most part, you can only discover the context of a person's family, a person's uh, belief systems, a person's uh, thought processes by asking questions, by being curious. And I've come to believe that a lack of curiosity in ministry can actually hinder your ability to reach people where they are. Because when you're not curious, all you bring to the table is your assumptions and your judgments. When that happens is you start preaching to a need that doesn't even actually exist because you thought that you knew what the need was. It's like, it's like when a person preaches at a girl considering abortion without actually wondering what brought her there in the first place. So, so they end up preaching to her mind and missing her heart as if her heart and not just her theological understanding is the reason that brought her to the clinic. Does that make sense? So a practical example of how being curious about cultural context serves us in ministry is this. Let's say you're part of a church in Texas. Shout out to anybody from Texas. Four of you, three of you. Um, according to statistics, there are 27,000 congregations in Texas. As compared to a place like Louisiana that has 5,800 5, uh, congregations, that is an immense amount of churches. If you are in a state with that many congregations and churches, it means that most of the women you evangelize to or disciple will be familiar with Jesus, the Bible, and church. That is cultural context. But in a state like Texas, the mistake that people make out of a lack of curiosity, out of a lack of laziness and not wanting to ask questions, is that they will assume that just because people grew up in church, just because people grew up around Jesus, that that means that they know Jesus. So they end up discipling people that need evangelism. They end up placing women in ministry who are nice but not sanctified. They end up serving under pastors that went to seminary and vote Republican as if that's the moral standard for God's people. So what happens is you end up having a church full of unbelieving believers. And this is why the church laughs at us. Because we're not asking the right questions. And our witness is suffering for it. Such as, when is the last time you repented? Do you know the gospel? When is the last time you cried in response to the gospel being preached? Are you even convicted of sin? Does it grieve you or are, are you only grieved because you got exposed? Do you pray? Does God speak to you? Can you discern his guidance in your life? If I asked your family, if you reminded them of Jesus, what would the answer be? We, we are not omniscient. We don't know as much as we think we do. So being curious gives us a measure of information that helps you apply your ministry efforts in a way that is wise and effective. I hope this is helpful. Observation number three, address their spiritual condition. Address the spiritual condition. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Plot twist, he is. He gave the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Refresher, reminder, Jesus is coming from a town and he's tired. He sits down at a well with another woman from Samaria and she arrives to draw some water. He asks her for a drink, and the ma'am is completely befuddled by the request. And not because of the question per se, but because Jewish men don't ask women like her for it. Jesus then responds and says, if you knew, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him for living water and he would have given it to you. Jesus began this whole interaction with her with his humanity at the forefront, but now he's shifting. He's no longer concerned with her response to his question. Now he's bringing her attention to the fact that she's asked him a question, but just not the right one. And it's because she doesn't know who she's talking to. All she sees is his humanity. All she sees is a Jewish man. 
and her inability to recognize that he is more than what he is is directly connected to her spiritual condition. To say it another way, she has come to this well to get water, but Jesus has come to show her that she has a thirst that natural water can't even fix. And until she sees him for who she is, she will never ask him for what she needs. It's that in our ministry to people, we want to introduce them to Jesus. We, we want to give them the gospel. We want to disciple them in Christ. But there are spiritual stumbling blocks that has to be addressed for people to even recognize that they need him. People will not ask him for certain things if they think they're okay. And that is why we have to address it. Every person, every person you will ever meet has a cultural context, but every person also has a theological context, which is that because we are born after Adam, we have inherited his sin and therefore we are all thirsty. It, it doesn't matter if you were raised in church. It doesn't matter if you tried to do the right thing your whole life. It doesn't matter if all you've ever stole is three, is three Snickers and two Twix. It, it does not matter. What, what the truth is, is that the Bible says all have fallen short of the glory. All, all universally have fallen short of the glory of God. And our experience of the sinful nature does not just manifest in rebellious behavior. Our experience of the sin of sinful nature is also experienced in having a deep soul dissatisfaction. Really, the behavior is a byproduct of the dissatisfaction. So we want security and we can't find it. We want peace and it keeps leaving. We want a right mind and we're still confused. And really what we want is God himself. We all, in a sense, want God. But the issue with sin is that sin wants us to want God but not God himself. Like we want the things that God has. We want the things that God has made. We don't want the person. We don't want the source. That's the delusion of sin is that we are born believing that everything that God has made is better than the God that made it. That's Romans 1. And there are two reasons for this. Sin produces ignorance and idolatry. Our ignorance is described in Ephesians when Paul says that we are darkened in our understanding. Sin don't just affect your behavior. You ain't just ratchet for no reason. Is that, is that apart from the Spirit's work, you don't think right. Your perspectives are skewed. Your, your decisions are off. You, you think you are wise in your own eyes when God says that you are foolish. We, we need God. Like, and out of this bad thinking, we look at the things that God has made. And instead of seeing them as being useful to worship him, we see them as opportunities to worship them. This is why we have a whole generation of people who looks at the star, and instead of seeing them as signs for seasons and for days and for nights, we give stars the power to determine our identity and our future reality. Do you understand how crazy it is to look at the sky, a created thing to tell you who you are and where you're going to go? I'm an Aries. I'm a Capricorn. I'm a Pisces. No, sis, you're an image bearer of the living God. The, the stars, that's divination. The stars do not have the authority to define you. You even limit yourself by, by living inside of a category instead of going to God to say, God, tell me who I am. And I say this, I say this with as much gentleness as I can. Romans 1 would call you a fool for trusting in the stars to tell you who you are, more than the God who made you. But do you know why you do it? You do it because you're thirsty for identity and direction. And so your needs, your needs are showing up as thirst. And out of ignorance, you are grasping and reaching for anything that will supply what you are lacking, which is forming the basis of your idolatry. Our, thirsty, our thirstiness, will always manifest in our behavior. So, so you can't change the behavior without dealing with the thirst. And how do we do that? We help people see that the water they really need is the water that Jesus has. When I was around 20, 
I'm about to expose you. I moved to LA and I joined the church. And while I was there, I ended up living with the woman who would disciple. <laughs> the Lord knew I needed constant conviction. And one day, I was really emotional and sad about missing my ex-girlfriend. Uh, if you didn't know, I, I used to be gay. Um, and I say used to be because I don't identify by my temptations. I identify with Christ. But we've, we, we had just been broken up for about six months. I was about 20. And I missed her because I loved her. But I left her because I could not love her and Jesus at the same time. So I had to choose. I had to choose. But the decision to follow Jesus didn't necessarily deliver me from the feelings of that relationship. So I'm walking around all sad and disheartened and depressed. There wasn't no Twitter back then, so I couldn't vent socially. <laughs> all we had was MySpace. And uh, I mean, she said, you know what? I'm going to give you an assignment because I'm really tired of you being sad about this girl. And I was like, okay. And she said, I want you to get a piece of paper, and I want you to draw a line down, line down the middle. On one side, I want you to write down everything that you miss about her. The things, and what you miss, I want you to write down the things that you think that only she can give you. On the other side, I want you to write down the scripture that shows you that God can give that to you too. I don't even remember, yeah, go do that when y'all get home, some of y'all that's sad about, it's not, it's not soul ties, it's idolatry, but I, I, that was a word, golly. It's true, sometimes we're not missing the person, we're missing the experience, right? And I, what, what, I don't remember even all the things I wrote, because it was a long little list, and I know some of it was really st stupid 20-year-old stuff, like she made me laugh, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> but the thing that shifted my heart and has literally become the metric by which I deal with my own thirst is that on one side, I wrote down that she comforted me. She made me feel safe. She made me feel secure. And then on the other side, I, I pulled up Google because I didn't know the scriptures like that. And I said, scriptures about God and comfort. And I found 2 Corinthians 1.3 that says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our most merciful Father and the source of all comfort. I don't think you understand what that did for my heart. It, it helped me see that everything I was trusting, everybody else to give me, God already had. So I didn't need them. I didn't need the water that they had because it wasn't going to quench my thirst anyway. That's why I was so desperate for their attention. That's why I kept calling them. That's why I had to be around them because they were not eternal. They were not sufficient enough to feel my soul, my thirstiness. My thirstiness was an opportunity for me to see Jesus so I can be filled. The women we do ministry with are just as thirsty as we are. And in the same way that Christ has quenched our thirst, we have to teach them and lead them so they can experience the same. Observation number four, use what's revealed to reveal God. Oh, it's up there. Use what's revealed to reveal God. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. <laughs> and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. You know how much discernment it took for her to say that? <laughs> That's like when the prophets get up and it's like, hmm. I think somebody in, is in here is, is tired. We're all tired. I don't, it didn't take the Holy Ghost for you to realize that everybody's exhausted in 2023. <laughs> then came out of a pandemic. Anyway. I, I love this part because I think it evokes the messy part of me. Because I just wonder how Jesus said it. Like, I just want to know his tone. Like, if he was like, 
Like if he was like, you know, go call your husband and like ask for a drink and she's like, I ain't got no husband. He's like, yeah, I know you ain't got no husband. You had five, five of them, five. <laughs> Couldn't settle on one, just. But I don't think Jesus ridicules people. So <laughs> raise your hand if you've heard this story before. Everyone. Um, I ask that because sometimes when we have read very um, popular or common stories in scripture, we come to the text with assumptions. And I chose to move against my assumption by coming to this text very objectively so I could see what the text wanted me to say and not what the commentaries have drilled into me. How this portion is commonly explained is that Jesus is calling attention to the amount of husbands she's had as a means of revealing her sinfulness. In light of that interpretation, I'm personally not a fan of how this woman has been framed because of it. I, when I was studying it, I read several commentaries and several sermons, which is a part of why, I have to say this, why reading or studying and having a diversity of study partners in, is necessary. Because we have to understand that we bring our ethnic, our, our, our gender biases into our interpretations that can sometimes influence the way we see a text. Just because they saw it th that way doesn't mean that it's actually true. Okay, I have to say that. Now, they, they, would, they would call her a whore. They would call her a prostitute. And it's like, if you just look at the text, just look at the text. Does the text give you any clue to that being the case? First of all, she had five husbands. 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 Not five situationships. Not five boyfriends. Five husbands. It's hard committing to one, so for her to commit to five, Jesus, tells me <laughs> that she's at, we, at least a woman willing to commit to a covenant. At the end of the day, I don't know if John, the writer of this gospel, I don't know if his intention is for us to be so distracted by the personal details of this woman's life that we end up missing what the text is trying to tell us about Jesus. I'll say that again. I, I don't know if John, wants us to spend all of our energy paying attention and parsing the details of her life so much so that we miss what the text is trying to show us about Jesus. And I have a scripture unless you think I made that up. In John chapter 20, verse 31, he tells us why he's written everything. He said, these are written, why? So that you can know the Samaritan woman, so that you can know her business, so you can make a whole sermon about her sexual past. No, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That tells me that the whole book of John, which includes this narrative between the, Jesus and the woman at the well, the whole point is so that people will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, right? Which means that every time I read something in the book of John, I need to step back and say, what does this reveal to me about Jesus? We get so caught up in her sex life that we miss the point, which is Jesus. When you situate this passage, in the larger context of John, what you'll see is that what Jesus does with her is not altogether unique. But what Jesus does with her, he does on other occasions with the intention of revealing his deity. In John chapter 2, or John chapter 1, John, or Jesus sees Nathanael walking. When he sees him, he says, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael, like, how you know me? <laughs> Jesus responds, when, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Jesus wasn't there. J Jesus wasn't nowhere in proximity to Nathaniel, but because he has divine knowledge, he knew something he shouldn't know. In John chapter 2, when people were believing in Jesus, it said that Jesus would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. He did not have to Google what is in man. He didn't have to ask Peter, what is a man? He didn't have to ask anybody for advice or insight. He didn't need a prophet to tell him about y'all. He, he just knew in John chapter 5. Jesus walks into the pool of Bethesda, a place surrounded by the lame and the sick. And the text says that Jesus saw a paralytic man on the ground and that he knew 
he had been there a long time. He didn't turn to Peter and say, hey, Peter, how long he been there? Oh, man, he been here about 30-some years. And every time he tried to jump in the water, they get in and perform it. So now he just been laying there halfway asleep. He just needs you to, like, he didn't say none of that. He knew because he had divine knowledge. What is the point? The point is that Jesus, in this text, displays his divine knowledge of this woman's past and present to make the point that even if she does not know him, even if she cannot see him, even if she does not recognize him, even though she does not have any insight on him, he has always been knowing her. The Samaritan woman connects to Hagar. The Samaritan woman is separated from the people. The Samaritan woman is at a des desolate place next to some water. But at this, at, this, at this place, at this point, she, she's meeting with Elroy too. At this, at this place, she is seeing the God who has been seeing her. He is still doing the same thing, going to rejected women and revealing himself. From the beginning, from the beginning of this whole discourse, do y'all remember what her problem is? Her problem is that she does not know who she's talking to. She does not know God. And if that is the case, it does not matter if she had five husbands or one. When you do not know God, everything you touch is infected. Whatever is not coming for faith is sin. And ministry, and ministry, the way we apply this is that we get so distracted by the specifics, so distracted by the details. So, so distracted by the circumstances that we miss the big picture, which is that everything that comes up, we need to leverage to show them God. She has a terrible boyfriend. Okay, deal with that. But make sure you show her God so she knows how to handle relationships in the future. She's dealing with anxiety and depression. Okay, address that, but make sure you teach her how to cast her cares on God. So moving forward, as circumstances get hard and difficult, she doesn't need to call you all the time. She, she has her own relationship with God. Most of, most of your work in ministry and in the church will involve details, specifics, sin, exposure. But if you, if you focus in on and get distracted by what people are struggling with, and you miss that the point is Jesus, you will often become a legalistic discipler where you will help people to be good and be right and forget to tell them to be like Jesus. There are a lot of women at the church who are just like the women at the well who are told to just stop messing with men. But who is going to do the work of showing her how her life with men is a symptom of her thirst? Because if we just stop, or if we just tell people to just stop it, to just do better, to just do right, to stop being stupid, and we don't cultivate faith, we don't cultivate obedience, we don't teach them how to read their Bible, we don't teach them how to fast, we don't teach them how to pray, we don't teach them how to de depend on God, and what if we don't teach them, what will happen is they will replace one idol with another, and it's about idol that's acceptable to you and damnable to God. Like that, that's what happened with the gay community. That's what happened with the gay community. We kept telling people to be straight instead of telling people to go to God. There is a difference. There is a difference. I think sometimes, huh, I think sometimes what is pouring out of us is what we do. So if you, think your, if you think your works are sufficient, you'll teach that. If you don't have a depth of wisdom with God, if you don't have intimacy with God, if you don't have a prayer life with God, if you don't fast and pray with God, if you don't consider community with God, then I will not be surprised if the disciples that you make look just like you. That is why we need God. Use what's revealed to reveal God. Number five, practice true worship. Notice that a bunch of these instructions are really things that will serve us to be before we do. Because we can't teach what we aren't, right? Verse 20, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain 
nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. I love that it says the Father is seeking. When, when I thought about, when I was working through this message, how to speak to what it means to practice true worship, I was like, okay, I know I need to put some kind of illustration here. I'm not an illustration preacher. My mind doesn't, my mind thinks in ideas and logic, and, and, and so sometimes I get insecure, like, oh, I don't have stories like Tony Evans. But, <laughs> <laughs> so I was Googling sermon illustrations about worship. And I didn't like any of them. It just felt very unnatural. So I just said, I'm going to just be very direct on the subject of worship. Because at this point, maybe metaphors aren't even helpful. So I, I, think, <laughs> I think the plain communication of Jesus' words might be sufficient for us. Which is that God, the Father, is seeking worshipers who will worship him in spirit and truth. That's it. That's it. That's all I got. See, the woman at the well brings up the topic of how Jews and Samaritans worship on a certain mountain and in a certain place, which means that Jews and Samaritans, both of them were dependent on a place as a means of worship. But Jesus says a time is coming and is now here when the mountain and the temple are no longer requirements for worship. Because he has come into the world to die for the world. Worship is no longer determined by a place, but a person. Not an altar, but a person. Not a ritual, but a person. Not a church, but a person. Not a political party, but a person. To put it as plain as possible, Jesus is saying that if ever anybody wants to meet God, they have to come through me. He is the new mountain, and he is the new temple. Therefore, the worship of the Father has made, or, or the worship of Jesus is made central to the worship of the Father. But notice, we don't get to determine what this worship looks like. Jesus doesn't say that true worship is either Marvin Sapp or Elevation. <laughs> that true worship is either Church of God in Christ or non-denominational. That, that true worship is doing what I want to do or doing everything. Like, like we, we don't, we've bought into the lie that we have the authority to categorize worship according to what feels most authentic to us. But in John chapter 4, it's, it ain't the woman at the well or even us or Jacob or none of them. Jesus gets to define the terms and conditions of true worship. He says that true worship is done in spirit and in truth. By spirit, Dr. Sridhan preached him silly, uh, or not the spirit silly, preached us silly about the spirit. He, he, the spirit is the means, the, the source of living water, the third person of the triune God, the Holy Spirit who indwells, who creates, who sustains, who motivates, who anoints, who convicts true worshipers. By truth, he means the truth about God as revealed in the Son, who is the way, the truth, and the life. See, if God is spirit, if God has no corporal body, then the only way we can know what is true about God is if God makes it his business to tell us. The, the only reason you know what God is like is because God has disclosed himself. God has revealed himself to you. And by what means has God chosen to reveal himself? Obviously through the scripture, obviously by the spirit, in the face of Jesus. It is Jesus who has made him known. I don't think, though, that many of us in this room would argue with what I just said. I, I, we like Jesus. We sing about Jesus. We talk about Jesus. We write about Jesus. We teach about Jesus. We got tattoos of crosses on our collarbones. And Bibles in our backpacks. We love to take pictures on Instagram with the open Bible, with the highlighted in Leviticus and the little cactus plant and the cup of coffee. Like, <laughs> who told us that that's the paradigm for devotion? But. Pinterest all over. I, I don't think, I don't think I have to convince many of you that Jesus is the focus of true worship. But what the scriptures, by the power of the Spirit, have to show you 
is that none of what I just said proves you're a true worshiper. If, if in your, you can read and you can do the devotionals and you can sing all the songs, you can go to church, you can be disciples, you can do all this stuff. But if in your practices, in your priorities, and your perspectives, if there is no active reality that Jesus is Lord, you are not a true worshiper. God is, is not seeking the kind of worship that fills sanctuary Sunday after Sunday where we sing songs to the Father and live however we want. With preachers, preachers who don't even open the Bible and have, it, have the audacity to call it ministry. And if they do, they spend 40 minutes telling us about ourselves as if we already don't spend enough time talking to ourselves about ourselves as it is. God is not seeking the kind of worshipers who are content with only depending on the Holy Spirit when it's time to minister, when it's time to sing, when it's time to preach. But as soon as we get home, we are mean to our children. We are disrespectful to our husbands. We are worldly with our coworkers. Unless they know our position, then we change our tone. God is not seeking the kind of worshipers that need Christ and witchcraft, Christ and renaissance, Christ and ancestors, Christ and orishas. Christ and divination. God is not seeking the kind of worshipers who think that they can be carnal and still be pleasing. God is not seeking the kind of worshipers who will go to conference to conference, do devotional after devotional, always learning and never at any point coming to a knowledge of the truth because they are burdened with sin and slaves to their passion. God does not need you to keep coming here if you won't believe what you already know. God, God is not seeking. God is not seeking the kind of worshipers that are satisfied with the bare minimum synchronistic Holy Spirit quenching Christianity that is so endemic to America. And maybe because we started with a demonic sense of what Christianity was in the first place. Jesus said, his people, they honor me with their lips. But their hearts are so far from me, in vain, it's useless, their worship. God is seeking worshipers who will worship him in spirit and truth. The good news is that the very fact that God is the one doing the seeking means that all we have to do is be found. Jesus has done the work. He's lived the life. He's conquered sin and death. He's, he's given his spirit to all who repent and call on him in truth. Jesus has actually torn down every obstacle to us being able to worship the Father, which means that if you want to continue as a true worshiper, and if you want to begin as a true worshiper, all you have to do is believe in Jesus. Observation number six. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Look at verse 27. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar <laughs> and went into town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Remember the point of John. She's found it. They went out of the town and were coming to him. Verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. This is the, this is the testimony that you want in your ministry. Verse 42. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves now. And we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. After Jesus reveals himself as Christ, as the Messiah, the water leaves, or the lady leaves her water jar because I think she's found a better source. 
I think she's found what will actually quench her thirst. And she goes back to town as a witness to the glory that she's seen. She says, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Jesus began his ministry to her in simplicity. Give me a drink. And she begins her ministry for him in simplicity. Come and see. She, she doesn't go out and start a church. She, she doesn't go out and preach a sermon even. She, she doesn't create a podcast or write a book. And all of that's good because I done done half of it. <laughs> but I didn't start that way. All of it is good, but I need you to appreciate how her ministry begins. It, it begins in simplicity, and I think that will free you up from some anxiety. Because it's the, like, we think we need the fireworks. We need the rainbows and the balloons. We, we need all the, the bigness and the extravagance or a large pro, for platform to be effective. But it's actually the, the simple things that are effective and glorifying to God. Whether you know a little Bible or a lot of Bible, God wants to use you exactly where you are. God intends to use you exactly how you are. Whether you've known Jesus for 12 minutes or 20 years, God has never needed you to be more than what you are for him to use you. All he needs is your yes. You might be thinking that you got to do the most to begin. But is that Jesus telling you that? Or is that social pressure? It could be that next week, next Wednesday, that's usually when Bible studies happen. I don't know who picked that day. But next Wednesday in your small group, maybe the way the Lord wants you to start to walk in the courage and, and the passion of ministry is instead of sitting in the corner being quiet, you raise your hand to pray. You, you edify the saints by having a conversation with God. That's simple, but it's effective. Maybe it could be that, you know, you know how every Sunday the announcements go forward and the person comes up and they just, just Sunday after Sunday, they just keep saying how they need people in children's ministry. We, we got 75 kids and three volunteers. Maybe, maybe they keep saying that so you would just raise your hand and just say, you know what, I'll help. And, and, and some of us have an arrogance about us where we say, God, use me, but you want to be used in the place that you feel gifted for. But maybe God wants you to show up where the church has a need. It could be that you do have a ton of gifts that nobody sees, and it's because God is hiding you. Maybe you're, you're in a season of de development because if God released you now, it would be to your destruction and everybody else's. Because you're not even prepared for the weight of the call that he's given you. So now is the time to pray. Now is the time to be discipled. Now is the time, like, like the apostle Paul didn't just go out and start apostling. I made that up. He spent time away after his conversion to be developed. I think for the older saints, I don't even have a word for you except to say pray. Pray and say, God, I've been, I've been with you for a minute now. I've been walking with you for a while. What do you want me to do in this season? Who do you want me to be? How do you want me to show up? How do you want, I think about Daniel, who in the beginning of his ministry, he was having these prophetic, these big situations. Like you're giving words to Nebuchadnezzar and you, you over here in the lion's den. You, but at the end of his ministry, it was a ministry of prayer. It was a ministry of intercession. A couple months before or after I became a, a Christian, I had a really large desire to teach God's word. Mind you. I didn't know one scripture. All I knew was John 3, 16, because it was at the bottom of the Forever 21 bag. That's all I knew. That's ministry. Simple, but effective. And, but even though I didn't know a lot, what I knew I wanted to teach and understand. I, I just wanted, I didn't even know what the spiritual gift of teaching was. I had never even read Ephesians or Corinthians or, 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 or like, I didn't even know. So I text my friends one day. I said, hey, let's start a Bible study. So we went over my one friend's house. She was the friend, the only one that's kind of independent yet. And so she has an apartment, but it's like a sanctified crack house. Like it's just one couch and four forks. <laughs> and they always got an internet router somewhere in the middle of the living room. It's just, 
It's never hidden, it's just always public. And <laughs> we were so broke. We, we would go to her apartment every Thursday and we'd sit around and talk about the Bible. And I had this really great idea one day where I was like, hey guys, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna watch The Passion of the Christ and I would pause every scene for us to find in the scriptures what the scene, it was, don't even worry about, it was the longest Bible study <laughs> I have ever done in my entire life. Mind you, that wasn't it. I also bought some post-it notes and I gave a stack of post-it notes to everybody and I said, write one sin on each post-it note so that as Jesus was getting beat, it was like lust. I got, I got healed from my iniquities and by his wounds I am healed and uh, he was crushed from my transgressions. It was just paper all over the floor and I should have made them red because it was yellow and orange and lime green papers. Red would have been more on, on brand for what was happening. But I use that as an example because I, I think I'm still technically a, a beginner in ministry, right? I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a middle schooler in Jesus, right? But I don't want some of the young people in this room to think that you need a conference or a platform or publicity, that you need to be exalted before you start. You, 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 you don't need to be exalted before you start because oftentimes those are the people that, like, when you have that kind of motive, usually God will not even allow you to be up here to protect you because your motives aren't right. That, like, be okay. Be okay with giving God glory when you're invisible. He sees you and he will honor you. The thing about the woman at the well is she kept it so simple. She did not do a lot, but what she did was more than enough. Did you realize how complicated her, her, her ministry witness was? All she did was say, come and see Jesus. She just left a seminary class with Jesus. Y'all realize that, right? She learned about the Holy Spirit as living water, the insufficiency of true water. She's learned how the entire system of worship for Samaritans was collapsing into the person of Jesus. She's learned how salvation is the Jew, from the Jews, how God is seeking, uh, sp uh, seeking worshipers who worship in the spirit. She's even learned that Jesus is the Christ, and he hasn't revealed that to anyone at, at this point in this book. But she didn't go and tell them none of that. One, it was too much to understand. But second, I think she knew. She knew that if they just go see him for themselves, they will learn all that they need to know. In your ministry to women at wells, what God is calling you to do is to point every woman to Jesus. Why? Because the Bible says, I'm going to read what the Bible, it says that he is the image of the invisible God. That he is the one who made all things and that without him, nothing was made that was made. That he is the word made flesh. That he is the son of God. That he is the one born of a virgin. That he is the one who was wrapped in cloths. That he was the one who was born in a manger. That he is the one to which the angel said, today in the town of David a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. He is the one whose straps we are unworthy to untie. He is the lamb who's come to take away the sins of the world. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the Christ. He is the anointed one. He is the son of David. He is the seed of the woman who crushed the serpent's head. He is the one who bore our sins in his body on the cross. He is the one who took our pain and bore our sufferings. He is the one who was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. It is by his wounds that we are healed. He is the one who became a curse on a tree. He is the one who was buried. He is the one who got up. He is the one who was raised from the dead. He is the one seated at God's right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and all authority and all power and all dominion. And he has the name that is above every name. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the one sitting on a white horse. He is the one who was called faithful. He is the one who was called true. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning and the end. He is the one who is worthy to receive all glory. He is the one who is worthy to receive all honor, all power. And this Jesus is coming soon.
and your ministry, however it may look, please remember this. Women don't ultimately need you. They need you to give them Jesus. I know some of y'all want to rush out, but if you, you don't mind, I would like to pray and then close. Is that okay? Lord, God, you sent the disciples out with a promise. The promise was not just merely that you would be with them until the end of the age but the promise was that you would be in them, that we would receive power from on high. God, we ask for power, the power to preach and teach, the power to love, the power to administrate, the power to be merciful, the power to be forgiving, the power to parent well, the power to love our neighbors, the power not to, to pursue worldly entities or worldly lusts, God. Make us women who have the power to love you with all of our hearts and with all of our mind and with all of our soul. God, you made us for your glory. You made us for yourself. All things were made for you and that without you was not anything made that was made. That means that we are not even walking in our purpose until we find you. God, I pray that we would find you and that we would love you and that we would serve you and that we would honor you. I pray, God, that we would not be satisfied with getting our ears itched and our ears scratched by people that make us comfortable in our idolatry and comfortable in our sin. Even if the people in the church don't see us, you see us, God, but you also welcome us to be forgiven and to be free. So free us, free us, set us free to glorify your name and love our neighbor. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming.